In the previous two videos, I worked through the details of polar coordinates in R2. In this video, I want to introduce the other two coordinate systems that I'll use in this section of the course. Both are descriptions of R3, and both extend the ideas of polar coordinates in some way. First is cylindrical coordinates. As the name implies, the idea is based around a cylinder. Specifically, every point in R3 can be identified as a point on a cylinder oriented along the z-axis. Cylindrical coordinates is essentially polar coordinates for x and y, and then the usual coordinate for z. It identifies points on a circle and then a height above that circle. The radius coordinate r is the distance out from the z-axis. The angle coordinate theta is the angle from the positive x-axis counterclockwise in the xy-plane, and the height coordinate z is the height above the xy-plane, which is the usual z-coordinate. Since cylindrical coordinates are essentially polar coordinates with the usual r3z, the transformations are the same. x is r cos theta, and y is r sine theta, just like with polar coordinates, z is just z. The inverse transformation is the same as well, with r the square root of x squared plus y squared, and the angle the arctangent of y over x. As with polar coordinates, this transformation needs a Jacobian to understand the change in volume. I get this by the determinant of the Jacobian matrix, the matrix of all the partial derivatives. I take the coordinate transformations from the previous slide and do all nine partial derivatives, in r, theta, and z, for each of the three Cartesian coordinates x, y, and z. I put these in a matrix and take the determinant. And again, if the matrix setup is unfamiliar, all I need out of this is the result. The Jacobian of cylindrical coordinates is r, like polar coordinates. This hopefully makes some sense. These coordinates are polar coordinates in x and y, and just with the usual z. The only, polar, only the polar adjustment area is needed, the z term is unchanged. To understand the bounds of integration, it is useful to understand what shapes arise when each coordinate is constant. If the radius is constant, then the distance from the z-axis is constant. The height can change and the angle goes all the way around the circle, and the result is an infinitely tall cylinder of radius c around the z-axis. This is the cylinder that the coordinates are based on. When the angle is constant in polar coordinates, I got a ray from the origin outwards. Now that height is also included, I get a half plane above this ray going out from all points on the z-axis. Finally, when z is constant, then I have constant height. The radius and angle can change, which means that I can have any distance out from the z-axis and angle position anywhere around the circle. And the result is the entire plane z equals c, a horizontal plane at height c. The last coordinate system I want to introduce is spherical coordinates. In polar coordinates, I identified points by which circle they were on. In cylindrical coordinates, I identified points by which cylinder they were on. And here, unsurprisingly, I identify points by which sphere they are on. I have a sphere of radius r centered at the origin. The radius term here is therefore the distance to the origin. Note the difference with cylindrical coordinates. Radius there was the distance to the z-axis, radius here is the distance to the origin. Radius determines the sphere, but how do I determine a point on a sphere? Well, I can do so using two angles. The system here is almost exactly the same as latitude and longitude on the surface of the Earth, using some angle to identify position. The theta angle is like longitude. It measures the angle around a circle in the xy plane, around the equator if you wish. It goes all the way around, so from 0 to 2 pi radians. It identifies which arc from the North Pole to the South Pole I am currently on. Then I need to identify a point on this arc. I need something like latitude. The angle phi does this. The major difference from latitude is the reference point. Phi is the angle down from the North Pole, with phi equals zero being at the North Pole and phi equals pi being the South Pole. I only go around a half circle here because I need to identify a point on an arc, a half circle, not the full circle. That's the idea behind spherical coordinates. What are the functions? The transformations? Well, I need to do some trigonometry. Phi is the angle down from the z-axis, 
So I can draw this triangle. R cos phi is the vertical part of this, so that fits the z coordinate. R sine phi is the horizontal part of this, which gives the radius in the xy plane. Then, since theta is an angle in the xy plane, I apply cos theta to get the x part and sine theta to get the y part from this, just as I did with polar coordinates. The result is these three coordinate transformations. The theta is called longitude, but this phi, which is measured from the North Pole, is called colatitude, not just latitude. For the inverse transformations, I'll only talk about r, which is the distance to the origin, the familiar length of the vector, square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. Phi and theta can be calculated with inverse trig functions from the x, y, and z coordinates, but I'm not going to really use that, so I'll leave it alone for now. What is the Jacobian? How does the volume change? Well, I go through the whole process again. I take all three transformations for x, y, and z, and differentiate in r, theta, and phi. Here are, are all those partial derivatives. I put them in a matrix, the Jacobian matrix. I take the derivative, which is quite a long calculation that I haven't shown here, so rather I take the determinant, which is quite a long calculation which I haven't shown here. The result is the Jacobian of r squared sine phi. Notice that there is an r squared here. This makes sense for the units. Phi and theta have no units, so multiplying by distance twice restores the units that are expected. Again, it is good to know what shapes result from the constants in each coordinate. When r equals c, I get a sphere that the whole system is based on. Fixed radius, but any of the two angles gives the whole sphere. When theta is fixed, this means the angle in the xy plane is fixed, the longitude is fixed. But the sphere can be as large or small as I want, and I can be at any co-latitude, any angle down from the North Pole. The result is, like with cylindrical coordinates, a half plane extending out from the z-axis. When phi is constant, the co-latitude is constant. However, I can be on any sphere. Just the angle from the z-axis is constant. And I can be anywhere around the horizontal circle. So the result is a cone. All values that have this fixed angle down from the vertical. And in, in addition, there is one special case. When phi is pi over 2, a quarter of a full circle, the points are halfway down from the North Pole to the South. These are the points on the equator, since the radius and longitude angle can be anything, the result will be the entire xy plane. I give these special loci, determined by setting one of the coordinates to a constant, to try to build some intuition about how the coordinate system works. I'll also use them when I start to set up integrals, since if any integral naturally has a region that is bounded by one of these loci, that's a really good indication to use the matching coordinate system.